Hi, Mary, it's your turn to speak. We just <clears throat> invited you to lead the discussion on the fraud. And I apologize thank you. for the glitch. Thank you. That's okay. I would like to say thank you to the members of the board of directors, the staff, and my fellow IAG members for inviting me to address the subject of fraud today. Um, I'm part of a subcommittee that um, actually also uh, had, had participated in a panel discussion on fraud at our last meeting. And it seemed to us that it was very difficult to put together a set of recommendations today that were definitive in terms of what the IAG really feels about fraud. So what we've done, knowing that 2405 or NOCLAR or non-compliance with laws and regulations was being revised. And as a matter of fact, it was presented to the board and approved yesterday. Um, we plan to review that 149 page document and draft a letter for the IAG in response to that. The fraud standard 2401 is in the process of being revised but it's a midterm agenda item that won't be probably reviewed for another year or so if I have my timing right. So we're kind of in the middle between these two standards being reviewed, but a lot of us feel that fraud is an illegal act and that no CLAR and fraud or 2405 and 2401 could actually be consolidated into one standard. Um, that's, that's the subject for the PCAOB, the staff members, and the board. But today, what we're going to do is go through, I'll go through some introductory comments, make some comments about fraud, some common thoughts that have been surfaced throughout my years on the IAG. And then we've put together a series of questions. So what we'd like to do, and James is going to take us through this, is throw out these questions to the members of the IAG. We come from a vast variety of backgrounds and experience. So we're going to try to consolidate these thoughts, look at them in the context of 2405, which just came out yesterday, the proposed um, new standard, and try to come up with a recommendation from the IAG regarding fraud. As we all know, fraud has had a fairly limited definition when it comes to the auditor or the audit. It's an intentional act that results in material misstatements of financial statements that are um, related to the audit. It sounded to me like when I listened to Kara's comments yesterday and the comments this morning from Barb, it sounds like that that definition has been slightly modified. So we'll have to take a look at that. Um, one of the things we did in our subcommittee is we went back and we looked at the history of standards and um, initiatives related to fraud. We've had, you know, we had the Cohen Treadway Commission in the 1980s. We had, you know, standards were, were, were established. Um, we go through history, we've seen many efforts to define and um, manage or look at the fraud in the context of the audit. And at the same time, we've had a series of scandals, corporate failures, um, and just, you know, financial catastrophes, if you, if, you, if you look at it from that standpoint. So there seems to be some elements missing here. Um, it isn't the auditor's job to prevent fraud. I mean, it, that can't be that isn't the auditor's position. So what is the auditor's role here? And how can we look at fraud from a, a broader perspective in terms of what might deter fraud? I mean, one of the things that we know is that the standards that have been in place may deter a lot of fraud, but we still see it in the um, financial statements. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I'm gonna raise some points that are common comments that we've received. And then I'm going to turn it over to James to open up the discussion. We're hope, we hope that you'll be very frank, um, disagree with each other, disagree with me, 
what we want to come out of this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I have COVID. <clears throat> what we want to come out of this is a real understanding of our position as the investment advisory group. So here are some things that I've heard over the years. Um, the audit firms are paid by the companies. So, you know, they work for the companies. They, their client is the company. And often, you know, they have other relationships with the company, very lucrative relationships. It, should there be a Glass-Steagall-like um, Chinese wall so that the audit isn't influenced by these other businesses. These are questions that come up repeatedly. Um, what happens when the auditor suspects fraud? Right now, the auditor goes to senior management, then the audit committee, and has the option, if nothing happens, to resign. And then the audit firms supposedly will report the suspicious fraud to the regulators. Nowhere in this process is the investor included. Is the investor notified of the suspicious uh, fraud, fraud, a suspicion of fraud? Um, the CAM conversation this morning was very interesting and, and really kind of got to the heart of some of this and the fact that very little gets put out there by the auditor to the investor community. Would that deter fraud? If, the, if, if fraud were made more public and more disclosure, would that be a deterrent? Um, the PCA will be or enforcement reports don't name the company. So we really don't know when we look at an enforcement report, what company we're dealing with. Um, the other point, the, the last point I want to make is charges against a company aren't really made public. And um, I'm not so sure that investors, look, listening to the CAM conversation this morning, I also don't know if investors seek this information out. So these are some issues that I just brought up today to get the conversation started. And I do hope that we can come up with um, some common concerns and some recommendations. As I said, we're going to review the new proposed standard 2405, and we will be writing a comment letter for you all to read. Um, so those will be specific recommendations. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to James, who's in the room with you. And um, James, I'm going to walk you through the questions that we've prepared to throw out to all of you to address as a group. Thank you very much, Mary. Often in Washington, it's said that you have a solution in search of a problem. That is not the case here. We actually have a problem. Last year, Chief Accountant Paul Munter highlighted that the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners estimates that organizations lose 5% of revenue to fraud each year an estimated loss of $4.7 trillion globally. Colleen Honigsberg, who spoke today on CAMS, in her paper, Forensic Accounting, found that taken together, forensic studies estimate that 10 to 15% of public companies engage in financial reporting misconduct in every given year. Now, we have a question. Are those numbers good numbers? And some people could actually differ because it will cost something in order to improve those numbers. Will the juice be worth the squeeze? From an investor perspective, we think so. On March 9th, we held a fraud panel. If you listened in on the panel, you would see the panel of experts, some litigators who basically try fraud cases against auditing firms, arguing that it's not even a close call by the time it gets to him, by the time it gets to him, with auditors acting in ways that you don't expect people to act in other contexts. We also heard from a former CFO of Enron who made the argument that during his time, 
the auditors actually sat in a room and figured out ways to basically make the numbers work and ways around the standards. In other words, there are creative ways in which we can, in fact, make things comply. There's a strong argument that we are not far from that. And if we're not, the question is, what happens when there's stress into the system? And then we had an academic who had a number of great ideas that flow somewhat um, outside of the box, so to, so to speak. But that outside of the box thinking may actually provide solutions that get directly at the problem. So as Mary suggested, publish the names of the clients whose audits were found to be deficient. Work on opening up competition based on audit quality. Make auditors publish work papers so that the investors can see what they actually did. Double the rate of whistle blowing payouts associated with audit firm irregularities. Consider the insurance model. Investigate why audit firms are not responsible for detecting fraud. This is an incredibly interesting one because most people in Maine America would think that that's exactly what auditors do. In fact, there are some auditors who think that. I can provide you with a clip from a panel discussion in which you asked, how do you make sure there's no fraud? And the answer is the annual audit. But when we look at AS 2401, instead of stating what auditors do to uncover, detect, protect against fraud, there's more wording in terms of what the auditors do not do. Toss it, off on, toss it off on management are the things that are really hard to do, as opposed to establishing what we expect of auditors. But more significantly, there's an expectations gap. If the average person thinks auditors actually detect and prevent fraud, and management thinks that's what they're doing, and they're not doing it, there's a gap that needs to be closed. If auditors are not to do that particular thing, we need to make certain that someone else does. Going back, why can't auditors, why can't owners appoint auditors? Some more creative thinkers thinking. If the auditors actually worked for owners, there would be more thought with regard to the investors. Another one, institute the proposed fraud research center. Housed at the PCOB. Longstanding proposal. Within the group, there were some additional um, considerations. Improve auditor ability. Training and exposure for junior auditors, more involvement of experienced auditors, make auditors better. Enhance the motivation to detect fraud. From the academic literature, it cites a number of things. And one of the things is like, if an auditor gets caught in litigation, the penalties are incredibly substantial. But it happens so infrequently that it's not a motivator for auditors to do much. Enhance more, so enhance auditor skepticism about management. That runs throughout. The standards actually cite at skepticism, skepticism, but when it refers to management, it argues that management is responsible. So, and in a number of cases, we have to look beyond management and get additional evidence to make certain that the auditors, that, that the financials are as we think they are, or if you detect fraud, that none exists, and it goes beyond just what the management says. And then encourage auditor and board engagement on fraud risk. So those are some of the things that came from the panel and from the subcommittee that d directly addressed some of the issues. Now, as Mary said, circulated along with 
a very detailed history on illegal acts, including fraud, were a series of questions. And the questions become incredibly important, but I think what's also important to note is that the, the consideration is off. So when you look at the history around fraud, some of the things that I've, that I've suggested actually happened, were considered, and the like. So there's nothing like really new but for some reason, they haven't been implemented or, or thought through. So the lesson from the past is that a top to bottom evaluation of the auditing of fraud and illegal acts is necessary if meaningful reform is to be accomplished. And I think that is, in fact, true. It was great to hear from Barb with regard to NOCLAR and the reference to 10A. This is important because it doesn't appear to be that the standards currently follow 10A. And to note that that improvement, I think, is significant. And we would expect that same improvement when focused on fraud. So we were presented with some questions, and they were, and they were circulated. And I would like to address a few of those. The first one goes from history. In the past, auditors of entities receiving federal funds would provide a separate audit report stating whether or not an illegal matter had come to their attention. Such a report is referred to as negative assurance. That is, that is the report would say nothing had come to the auditor's attention, or if something had, then the report would discuss it. Should auditors of issuers be required to provide negative assurance to investors and regulators in addition to the required reporting to the audit committee? And that is a question. Could I have someone with a view on negative assurance? No one has a view. Could I, before we, before we get into the questions, mm -hmm. I, as I was listening to you, James, I, I had a series of questions that would help me just kind of okay. understand and maybe be more responsive to the questions that you have. <clears throat> we use, you use the term fraud, okay? Do we mean, if we, if we mean fraud, what does that mean? Or do we mean more broadly theft? with theft be, or fraud being a component of, of, of fraud. Uh, let me just give you my questions and then we can, you can so sort let, through. Let, let, let me handle oh, that one because okay. that, Go ahead. That, that's a broad one when, yeah. when you're asking. Okay. In doing research on this particular project, I struggled with the use of fraud mm -hmm. because in the academic research, they reject it. And they reject it because fraud has a legal component which includes intent. And it's hard to say someone has committed fraud until you prove it in court. However, from a standards perspective, there's a fraud definition. And so the question is, you take the, you, you take the word and it's, there's a definition, and that's what you use for this particular context. Mm -hmm. But more precisely, even in Colleen's research around forensic accounting, fraud isn't used. And so it's financial reporting misconduct. And so the thought becomes, and maybe this is a question, whether we would benefit by using a different term, getting to the same result, but doesn't have the legal connotation of fraud. Because when you say fraud, it really says that someone is stealing. But I offer up that there is, in fact, an a definition that would work, but it's confusing with the legal concept of fraud. It just it seems like if we were going down this path, we'd get hung up with the definition of fraud and how would you apply it. I, I know that we use it, but what I've learned is, is once you start putting 
emphasis on reporting or all of a sudden that word fraud that we thought we understood mm -hmm. isn't as well understood. So I just put that out as so, a, a question, you know, and I, I just jotted down, you know, fraud, theft, is it misappropriation? Is it collectively all of these misappropriation of assets, regardless of what form that takes, whether it was fraud or theft or some other other form? So I put that out there as a, I'd want to know more about this if we were, you know, heading down the path of answering all these questions. The you mentioned the term, you used the term auditor numerous times. Are we talking about internal, external, or both? So, I was primarily talking about external auditors because, unfortunately, the internal auditors at a number of companies pretty much aren't in existence, and so. Um, the rules, if you're a financial services firm, are quite robust on internal controls and inter internal auditing, not so much so outside of that particular context. And so in other venues, I've been a promoter of having more internal controls and more internal auditors. So, but in this context, I'm talking about external, external auditors. Okay, so it would be helpful to be clearer on, on that. So we're talking about the external audit. And if there's an internal audit function, it's just part of the overall internal control structure of the game. Okay. And then the final is, it seems like you, know, you, you went through a laundry list of things that we could do on a spectrum. There was one end of the spectrum, there were just tweaks to the existing framework that we've all operated with for decades. On the other end of the spectrum, and Jack and I have been talking about this a little bit, this is the, more the insurance model. And <clears throat> it seems like they can cohabitate, but obviously, if you're heading one one end of the model or one end of the spectrum or another, you're going to have a lot of different discussions. So, should we at some point kind of narrow down? We're we're, we're going to operate on this end of the spectrum. We're only going to do tweaks, or no, we're actually going to push to have a really different model out there. And then the question is: Is it a required model? We don't have the ability to do that. The legal ability. Or is it a, you throw that out as an option? If you went down the insurance model, and Jack and I were talking about this, not to keep yeah. pushing Jack to make sure that, you know, it's not you're just me right. with the crazy you're idea. There are two right. of us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think. I'd be happy to talk about my crazy idea. Go ahead. I think it would be important for yeah. um, everyone to learn more about the insurance model. So okay. could you okay. share what well, the insurance that, model is? So we're, what we're going to focus on is really tweaks to the existing yeah. model. Yeah. But when you mentioned the insurance model, that to me is a really big shift, one I would support, but it has a lot of different baggage with that model. A lot of different baggage. Um, before I explain the insurance model, okay, sure. yeah. elucidate. Yeah. Pardon me? Mike. Oh. Yes. Thanks. Just wanted to make sure you were somebody, I think it was James, said financial reporting misconduct in place of fraud, mm -hmm. which seems to me pretty workable. If there's financial reporting misconduct, somebody's absconding with assets and covering it up, that's misconduct. I, that I'd want to know about that. I, I, oh, I just want. Did, I, would that? You I think agree, that would but be? I was thinking of theft in a broader mm -hmm. sense, and I want to know about theft, regardless of the format or the form that yeah. it takes, and who's conducting it. But, so, so do you do you want to know about it, regardless of the amount as well? Wear material. That's, that's always a hard one, yeah. um, because if I if I look at the issue of materiality, and you end up having to look at the different types of investors, and I would say the the investors are on a spectrum, and that there are going to be some that have a different materiality threshold than others. So I would be leaning toward a probably a lower materiality threshold to okay. to focus on investors who are more concerned, and that gets into a Fundamental analyst and I the more quantitatively driven or um, Gina, yes. Yeah, I, I, I would argue that um, the issue of materiality should be one that applies to errors and omissions, but not to fraud. Okay. All I wanted to get yeah. out was Sorry. that that drops the floor to zero. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, I, I just thought whoever said financial reporting misconduct. I thought that was a good way to get around all of the bad or the incorrect connotations of using the word fraud. I think that's useful. Um, so 
quick and dirty insurance model. Um, it's well beyond, I think, the scope of what we're talking about here, but just to make sure that everybody's on the page so that when you hear it again, you'll know something about it. I believe it was developed by a professor at NYU, Joshua Ronan, R-O-N-E-N. And I first heard about it in an exposure draft from a PCAOB um, standard. Um, and went and looked at the paper and thought, this is really pretty clever. Okay, it, It's far beyond w what the system we have now is. I think we'd have to really be empowered only to be doing tweaks to the system, as Hal put it, because you can't just adopt this without probably some congressional act. But in the insurance model, you have insurance companies who are, in effect, I don't want to say guaranteeing, but they're providing assurance that the financial statements are usable for investors, that they are free from defect. They have a warranty of merchantability. They're good for what you intend to use them for. They comply with GAAP. They're free of defects. They don't have fraud underneath. So insurance companies contract with publicly traded companies for a premium to take this risk on themselves. The auditors are appointed by the insurance company. The insurance company is going to find the most rigorous auditors that they can get to do the job for them so that their risk of loss is lowered. The insurance company has the same goals and desires as investors who use those financial statements that they're guaranteeing or warranting. Uh, the auditors have the same goal as the investors, and they're being paid by the insurance companies, those who have skin in the game, rather than the company themselves. The companies have an incentive to make sure that those financial statements are free from defect, free from fraud, because they will be able to control, they will be able to bargain for a lower premium from the insurer. So everybody's incentives are in the same line. That's the beauty of the insurance model. Now, when you promote this to somebody, they usually say, well, we can't do that because there isn't enough insurance underwriting capacity in the world. I don't know about that. If the audit was optional, uh, maybe there would be enough capacity in the world. I don't know if there's enough capacity in the world right now anyway, um, even without doing something like making the audit optional. All these things are not something that you can just tweak around the edges. It's a completely new paradigm. Yeah. And Jack, I'll just add to it. I mean, right now, in effect, the industry, the auditors are yeah. acting as an insurance company with Without no capital. capital. Right. With no capital. So in any case, yeah. we brought this up, James brought this up, I think, just as a possibility of you know eliminating fraud or reducing fraud or getting incentives aligned. So that's where we're coming from when we talk about the insurance model. For, and like I said, maybe this is a project that we could work on as far as exploring by contacting some insurance executives and getting a better understanding on it as a, as a thought project at least. I, I don't know. But anyway, we just we haven't flushed this out. We were just talking about it this morning. Who's that? I think Maddie has a I have a question. For the, oh. I have a question for the group, and that is, you know, we're talking about tweaking the standards that we have now. That's exactly what we're doing. There's not a lot of, I, don't, I haven't read 2405 or the new one, and I'm hoping there's quite a bit of change there. But, you know, maybe it, the question for the group is, and if you look at the timeline that we looked at, going back the 70s and the 80s and all the efforts to tweak the model, and yet we just have this string of failures, <clears throat> is... <clears throat> Is it time that a group like us, who represent investors, say we want to do more than tweak the model? I mean, Jack, I think what you're saying has a lot of merit. Is finding another way so that the, the auditor <clears throat> isn't a client of the company. They're not hired by the company. Um, maybe there's some, rep, some changes that we could make that are go beyond the PCAOB. I realize that they don't have, PCAOB doesn't have the power to reform the entire audit community. But if we as a group think that there needs to be that reform in order to protect investors, 
then maybe we should consider it. In other words, I think we ought to think about change in terms of protecting investors and maybe diminish the string of failures and scandals and so forth. That That's the question I'm throwing out so, right now. Can I, Do we want yes, to think I think one of the things that I think about when I think about fraud is that fraud is often known within the organization, um, at, at least among the co-conspirators and often beyond the co-conspirators. And what frustrates me is that when the auditors come to a company to do an audit, um, they are effectively walled off from everyone. You're not allowed to go anywhere near the room where the auditors <laughs> are conducting their audit as a matter of of you know the company being very conservative about who the auditors even get access to discussing. So the ability to come forward and whistleblow is a matter of course to come and tell an auditor, I think you should look at this or you should look at that. That mechanism is already not functioning well, meaning that auditors haven't figured out a way to create their own hotline, if you will, to be able to speak to people within a company who want to blow a whistle. So whistleblowing requires you to go out, get a lawyer. There's a lot of friction that goes with, with um, whistleblowing, and the notion of retaliation is a very real thing. I think at the very least, we have to open the channels of communication and, uh, and, and maybe expect the auditors to facilitate greater communication. And this will be very uncomfortable for any company. They will not want that. But it is something that I think could help improve the quality of the audit by virtue of simply being given a notion of where to look. Thank you very much, Gina. And yes, Sandy. So to Gina's point, I mean, I was, I've looked at the ACFE report with 2022, and the most likely res, uh, indicator of a problem is tips, 42%, three times the next possible source. And, you know, maybe it's early in the conversation to talk about it, but I was a defaulted bond speculator for many years. The losses from these events are not as great as the perception created by the newsprint. Does anyone know what the Lehman recoveries were? 100% for any investment contribution to the accounts, 100% for all secured lenders, 41% for subordinated lenders, everyone else was zeroed out. These are in, made off, made off, 90% collection of the deposits made to the fund. Now, he said he made $64 billion, but he didn't. That was fake. But there were $19 billion put into the fund and nearly $17 billion paid out to investors to date. This is, you know, the economics of actually building in an insurance company between an an, inv an investor and an auditor, that sounds like doubling the cost to me. I mean, I would, be, I would be cautious as an investor to consider layering in more profitability for another organization between me and an auditor, because it's all paid for by the company. I mean, you look, who else is going to pay for it? So, I, so, I, so, so are you saying a lot of this is are you saying capitalistic the, Are you saying the path forward is to work with the system we have and improve so upon it? Tweak the system, okay. uh, a focus on COSO uh, recommendations, ACFE has uh, uh, principles that they build from that. And I think the auditor's position is basically to understand what a company does to protect itself from fraud, labor fraud, inventory shrinkage, receivables fraud, lack of collectability, employees not showing up for work, and accounting fraud, right? So you need to protect yourself from that. But there are co corporations and public institutions like mine who say, we understand those, we don't have controls to protect all of them. We self-insure, and that's our decision. And we accept that there is leakage in the system. There is leakage in the system. We, you're not going to stop fraud. You're not going to start crimin stop criminal activity, and you have to boost up your prosecutorial efforts. Okay. And so we, we have a $4.7 trillion problem, and I don't think it's realistic that we're going to make that $4.7 trillion zero. And so the question is, what steps can we take to close that gap significantly? Is one of them in question four? So basically closing the gap. If an auditor actually sees fraud, should there be a requirement that they do something about it? 
That's what, and I, I have a veneer thin understanding because <laughs> I've been doing research for the last couple of weeks after I got your questions. But one of the uncertainties that exists, I believe, is state level regulation of accountants speaks to this question. In some states, the auditor is not allowed to talk publicly about a fraud determination. The only thing they can do is resign. Tell management they don't have an option under state regulation to report it. Prosecutors, investors, the public make a press release. They're not allowed. That's my understanding. And that's after so, reading academic papers on the question. So, so would there be value having a negative assurance report basically having the auditors state that they did not see fraud. I think that's quite reasonable because that, that's unlikely they will because they do sampling audits, right? They don't, they don't look at every transaction, no, which is I mean, I mean, why you have forensic there, auditors. There are court cases <laughs> where the auditor actually saw fraud from over multiple years, ignored it, and then argued that they ignored it because it wasn't material to the financial statements. Isn't that management making the decision that it's not material? I mean, it may be, it, it's hard to argue. It's hard to argue on the side of fraud. Very hard to argue on the side of fraud. <laughs> but, but you're making that It is an economic, you well, it's an acceptable <laughs> right. leakage, right? And okay. it's not acceptable to have higher audit fees. That doesn't compute. Well, if, if a higher audit fee I've were never heard, to I've offset. never heard an, a conference call on earnings where they said we missed our earnings because the audit fee was too high. True. <laughs> True. Yeah. So in the interest of time, let's move on to the next question. And why has the PCOB not created a national fraud center as recommended by the U.S. Treasury Advisory Committee on the auditing profession? The U.S. Treasury Advisory Committee recommended that there should be a fraud center ho housed in the PCAOB. And some of the topics that we talked about, we'd have an actual body of work that might address it. What's entailed in the fraud center? Other than a hotline to call, once you get the call, what would happen? Jeff, can you help? So, Hal, the, the idea was that this would be a center to collect data and information about uh, fraud when it occurs and try to learn from that and potentially use that information and studies of that information to develop some best practices. Uh, that was the idea. And it was wildly supported at the time, not only by investors, but uh, including uh, James, a uh, former employer, Cal Burrs, Center for Audit Quality, Ernst & Young, Grant Thornton, National Association for State Boards of Accountancy, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, the Treadway Commission. So, so I, I call the fraud center up and say, Sandy Peters has been ripping off the company, okay? Who no, knows? That, like who knows? Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this Sandy and I lived in the same town for a while, so no, I'm oh, not. Okay. I, yeah. Not um, no, Sandy yeah, exactly. Rich. <laughs> She's Sandy Rich. But, She's Sandy poor. Yeah. My, no, my question is, you've collected the data, but who's to verify the quality of that data, and what use would that data be without some verification as to the quality of the data? That's why I asked. So it, it was not right, about. We, we got this sounding board. Who? I, Sandy could have been completely innocent and done nothing wrong. I just misinterpreted. Or either Sandy. <laughs> they were conspiring with each other. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. You know, it, on the surface, it sounds like, boy, yes, I can jump behind that. But when I start just digging into it a little bit, I question. Well, we, we gathered the data, and now we're going to do analysis, but any academic study has got to challenge the quality of the data, and I don't see that function being discussed. So. The, uh, the report itself uh, doesn't go into all those details, Hal, so I, 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 but what I can tell you is it, it was based on the idea we have a train wreck in the United States, and we send in the federal government. They take a look at what happened. They write a report and explain uh, 
what probably caused this, make, make some recommendations on how we may prevent these types of things in the future. That was the idea. It wasn't a center to people call in. It was a center to study the issue of fraud, have academics involved as well, have practitioners involved. So once they identify involved. something, there's a, an investigative team that goes in. Well, that's a, well. No, you use the train wreck yeah. analogy, right. and having had a relative who worked there and done that type of investigation, they're all experts. They go fly in. They're on the ground. They're collecting the information. They're doing a real analysis of the data, and and making a determination as to cause. I'm trying to understand who would be doing that type of analysis. My understanding of it was that this was um, information that would be reported post audit and collected in one place to study oh, so the this findings. Isn't, this isn't a hotline. No. Okay, so the auditors would say, We saw this, we did nothing, but here's some information upon which you can do something. Hal, the, the bottom line, there wasn't like 20 pages describing in detail what this would be. Okay, I'm just trying to understand if we're going to kind of work on an idea. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about that idea. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just, I want to think through it a lot more than what I'm hearing so far. And I just, know if that work's already been done, that's great. I'll go read that. But you can read what's in the report, and there are several pages discussing the idea, but it never went into the detail okay. addressing the questions. Um, you're asking about, but it wasn't a call center. It was more of a think tank collecting information when fraud occurs, studying that information, bringing in academics to study the information, and then developing some best practices to help prevent fraud in the future. Okay. That was the idea. Can I make a comment yes. about, about something that we can control that is tweaking the existing which is, um, is it possible for us to consider making it a part of the standard? Right now, um, there is a standard for how auditors go in and do interviews. Can we expand that mandate by, by a matter of requirement in order to ensure that we can get a deep and wide scope of people that we talk to who have an opportunity and don't have to be singled out for walking over to the auditor's room they simply are summoned there. I mean, that, that's, that's the issue that I have, is that there is an enormous threat of retaliation if you know something is happening. And the idea that you have the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the courage to walk down that hallway and knock on the door and say, I need to talk to the auditor, that's scary for most average workers. And so you kind of have to make that a matter of, and it, it would be more work for the auditors. And so that's the question is, how do you do that in a way? Um, can it be done virtually such that nobody sees the person walking down? That I'm just simply kind of asking, are there ways we can in, enable and facilitate greater tipping? Because that is the best source of detecting fraud and, and require auditors to make it a part of their preparation. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next question. The panel on audit effectiveness recommended to the profession in auditing standard setter that each audit should include a forensic type phase to the audit. Is this a good idea? How does, explain to me the forensic element of this. So it, it, just so I understand, I haven't audited in a really long time, but we would spend a lot of time doing ratios and understanding relationships between numbers. Same thing that analysts do, very similar anyway. But forensic auditing sounds like it's a much more detailed assessment. So I'm trying to understand where on that spectrum are we talking about? Simple ratio analysis, do the numbers make sense in the big picture, or are we talking deep dive into some specific aspect of the numbers? I think in the academic studies I looked at, I think it's the use of technology to glean certain particular information. One study found that if a company backdates, there's a 95% chance that they had financial reporting misconduct. 
backdating of options was an indicator. And so basically from, through forensic accounting, you find out that, that particular information, so you look more closely at any company that did that particular item. Right. There's, an, there's, there's another item that forensic accounting has found out, and it's called quadrophobia. Quadrophobia is the lack of the use of the number 0. 0.4. Yeah, Benford. Because you always, always round up, and so basically you can manage the financials in a way that makes certain you always round up when it benefits the, when it benefits the company. And so the question becomes, should greater technology be used to be able to capture some of these issues? Because it's, it's interesting. You can, you, you, you can sometimes find an identifier that may mean that a company is more likely to have financial reporting misconduct. And, and that's, that's cited in the article I mentioned the, earlier today, the Wall Street Journal article talked about the Indiana University uh, professor who came up with a metric for analyzing the likelihood that the numbers have been tampered with. And there was an, and I forget, it starts with a B. Model. Uh, Banesh model. Banesh model. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of directionally what you're talking about, some version of that or comparable type of right. model that uses technology to look through and comb through all the data. Okay. I think the, 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 the I think what I read into the question that you asked was, um, and I thought, I thought about it from the perspective of, of technology, is because so much auditing is based on sampling, and so if you take you know one or two or three samples, the chances of you finding a needle in a haystack that way are pretty low. Um, if more and more audit firms um, have greater and greater technology now um, at their fingertips that are becoming a part of their standard offering, um, however, it is not required um, as a matter of audit standard to have audit tech available. Um, or to do full sample, because that's what, when you get into forensics, you get into to ensuring that you zero out and you have complete, you have a complete sample of all of the transactions, nothing is left out, and that requires technology. That, that can't be done individually, that has to be done with technology. And do, what does that do to the profession if you start to create a higher and higher hurdle in order to be, you know, an audit firm, you know, a, a reputable audit firm, do you have to make a huge investment into technology in order to enable your ability to meet our, the standards that we have? So it's 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 a push and pull uh, and because it, it will make it more expensive. And I know the big firms were all doing that. Yeah. And I, I used one of the graphics from one of their reports in a class I teach. And, it shows the progression each year. It's getting more and more sophisticated. So all we're trying to do is, from what I'm hearing you say, is memorialize that in some way, incorporate that into existing standards. Okay. Okay, Jack. Um, just to go back a little bit about history, um, the word forensics. Uh, Fifty years ago, when I was in <laughs> undergraduate school, forensic accounting was when you were trying to recreate a ledger because there had been a fire or the reconstruction of financial statements using less than original documentation. And that definition stood for probably about 20, 25 years. In the 90s, when we started having a lot of frauds, uh, there were companies that, research firms that positioned themselves as forensic accountants and were going to go in. And they were really doing what Al said, doing the deep dive and looking at ratios and looking at day sales outstanding and calling that forensic. I think, I, I, I go along with what Gina was saying, I think you need to come up with a standard for some minimal audit work, just like we have minimal standards on confirmations and observation and of inventory. Of inventory. Of inventory. Um, maybe we have some definition in the PCAOB literature for forensic work and prescribe things like looking at frauds models like the Banesh model or doing uh, construction, techno using technology to do a construction of the general ledger and see how that differs from the actual reported numbers or the, number, or the numbers in the ledger because we do have companies that, audit companies that will say they can do full, full 
studies of all the ledger or all the journals instead of doing samples. So, you know, maybe what we need is a standard that says this is what forensic procedures are and these are suggested or minimum requirements to do that. Thanks. Yes, Al? Amy? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. It, um, it's hard to get a word in edgewise with this group, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, not that I have a ton of uh, value add to the conversation, but I just wanted to point out some of the work that I believe the PCOB board is doing along this line. And I think that there is a little bit of nomenclature happening with forensic versus and in conjunction with uh, data and technology. I think the Venn diagram has significant overlap, and I know Christina has put together that um, committee to research that, and I think there's gonna be a lot that comes out of that, and I think we should watch their work really closely to see how we could potentially leverage that or make recommendations within this group on how we could leverage that. I know that Gina's, we're working on the subcommittee on that topic as well, so more to come on that, and I think this has significant gains and also ways to set auditing firms apart from one another. I think it may make it more difficult to compete against the large um, ones with deeper pockets, but also maybe some of that best practice can be leveraged with the smaller ones and create even further competition. I don't know how it's going to end up, but I'm going to remain positive on it, and I just wanted to put it out there because I think we're talking about some of the same things, and it's pretty dynamic, so more to come, I think, in the near future. Yes, Al? I, I think Amy picked up on directionally where I wanted to go. Going down the path like that, you can write a standard for those who have a lot of money to spend on technology, and it can end up putting mid-sized and smaller firms out of business because they will not have the money to spend on that. So we'd have to think about scalability. Um, I, I thought I would go through this whole session without mentioning Cecil, but that was a big topic. Um, you know, did we create a, an accounting model that only computers and mathematicians could love, or did we have something that was scalable and operational for a wide range? And I think that we're heading down this path of technology is great, but it can separate the haves from the have-nots, and I think we'd have to really consider any recommendations in that area, and, and what are the implications for the, not just the, the big four, but all the range of, of firms. And I think the question off, off that is what can we do to facilitate greater access to technology? Yeah. I also see David's hand up. David? Sort of a general comment on this. Um, I, I guess the starting point for this debate, as for many, many debates that we have, is the concern that the auditor end up, ends up working for the audited entity rather than for the investor that is the true client and therefore doesn't want to find a fraud, um, which of course is the, in the investor's interest to do, but maybe not in the audited entity. And what we're really wanting is somebody who can become an insider with real expertise, can use the principles of accounting and audit to discover what it is that's going on and present, make sure that we're presented with a true and a, a fair view of things. I think, um, in, intriguingly, that is only possible for them to do if the investor, the auditor, and the company itself all think of themselves as being on the same side. And I'm intrigued. Somebody, I think, said this earlier on, but certainly in the conversations I've had with accounting partners, if you say, where do the really tricky bits of an audit, be they fraud or something else, where do they emerge in the audit? They'll say, because somebody in the company told you that there was an issue, that actually it's in the first weeks of the audit when somebody comes to you and says, look, I'd really like you to take a look at this because this is concerning me about whether it is that we're doing this the right way or not. And I just wonder whether, as we're having this debate, that we get the atmosphere of this right, so that yes, we've got procedures, yes, we've got reporting um, a, a, a when things go wrong, but we're always working towards something where we're getting the auditor to play their role as though their client was the investor, that there were a set of principles we don't want to send every one of them to jail, but boy, do we want them to carry out those principles properly. And I wonder whether what you're seeing in the limitations on fraud has got the same cause as the limitations on CAMS, 
that people just don't want to do the job properly. They want to minimize what the probability of the job is. And, and you know, how could we manage to step back and a uh, create the sort of atmosphere? I, I, I'm always struck by, you know, in air safety, whenever anything goes wrong, everybody wants to report what's gone wrong. Everybody wants to learn the lessons. And it just feels to me that in audit, we're drifting away from that, where there's more and more and more rules, more and more and more protection, more and more and more cost. And I wonder whether there might just be some, some th simple things that would change the nature and the atmosphere of an audit that could reveal far more about fraud and call it out long before it becomes a big problem, as it has in so many companies. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. This has been an incredibly exciting discussion. And we will end it kind of where we started, where Mary, where Mary said, we have the no claw proposal to review and comment on, which we will do. So many of the topics we talked about are likely in no claw. And then we will come back to the board with a recommendation on 2401. And we will benefit from this discussion, and I assume based on the energy in this discussion, from several other discussions on the same topic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. This was definitely a very exciting and interesting uh, conversation. So thank you to every single one of you for contributing and listening. We'll take a quick 15 minutes break and be back here promptly at 3 p.m. Thank you.
Members of the IEG, if you could just please be seated so we could get started. Hal, Jeff, thank you. We gave, I, I got my cookie. <laughs> Okay, great. I think we'll come back for our break from our break for our last session this afternoon. Thanks for everyone for coming back. Next on our agenda is the IAG Subcommittee on Inspections and Data Transparency presentation to the PCAOB on enhancing the PCAOB inspections process. Alicia Damley, a valued member of the IAG, will be virtually providing this presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. First of all, I'm really sorry to not be there in person. Uh, I know how important it is for us as human beings to connect with each other, especially when we haven't had the opportunity to meet as yet as a group. Um, uh, first, uh, also, thank you so much for the opportunity to address the board, the PCAOB, and of course, uh, my fellow IAG members. If I'm not mistaken, I may be the only member of the subcommittee on today because I know our chair, Parveen Gupta, is uh, in Italy. Um, our second member, uh, Professor Nemi Shroff, is also unfortunately was unable to join. And since I can't tell who's in the room, I'm not sure if our third member, Lynn, Shroff, uh, Lynn Turner, excuse me, uh, is in the room. So uh, it may be a, me representing uh, it's our, just our you. Side. Oh dear. Okay. Well, I will do my best to hold up, uh, uh, hold up uh, the flag for the rest of my committee members, my subcommittee members. Uh, it has been a long journey, and it has been a very nuanced journey. I feel like I'm using that word over and over again. Uh, to get started, just by way of background, uh, to sort of set the stage in terms of why we've done what we've done in terms of what we're going to be sharing with you shortly. Um, at our last meeting, our virtual meeting on March 9th, we held a panel. Uh, it featured Professor Nematroff, who's an IAG member. He's the professor of accounting at the MIT School of Business. Uh, also, Elizabeth Mooney, a partner at Capital St Strategy Research, part of the Capital Group, and George Bodick. Uh, Director of Division and Registration and Inspections at the PCAOB. And we had a very good discussion, I hope you will agree, uh, regarding this issue around uh, data and uh, transparency around inspection. Following that, we held a number of virtual meetings to discuss how to pull together uh, a synopsis, if you wish, of what we'd like to share with not just the rest of the IAG, but also with the PCAOB on this important topic. It was a very robust and vigorous set of discussions, to say the least, and there wasn't always consensus around these recommendations. So I present these recommendations on behalf of the subcommittee uh, with clarification that they weren't necessarily, uh, everyone on the subcommittee wasn't necessarily in agreement, but we felt that there was sufficient consensus to bring them forward for discussion uh, within this particular forum. So moving to our presentation on slide two, our standard disclosure, which we thought was important to, uh, to identify, these views are solely for the investor advisory groups, uh, advisory group members who prepared them and do not necessarily reflect the views of the PCAOB, the PCAOB staff, the members of the board, or the board staff. They also do not necessarily represent the views of its individual members or the organizations of which they are employed. Slide three. Uh, what did we do uh, or what was our charge, uh, which was to provide advice to the board on how to enhance the PCAOB's audit firm inspections for the benefit of investors, i.e. explore some possible ways to improve the inspection process and enhance the reporting of the results related to the, the, inspe the many inspections that the PCAOB undertakes, and also compared the PCAOB's inspection process, funding and staffing to other international organizations that have similar inspection programs. We embarked on this process, but we don't have specific recommendations that we felt we were going to bring to the table on that last bullet. 
slide four, uh, a little bit of detail. I've already identified who the members are. Our process were regular meetings uh, to discuss and review the state. The outcome of all of this was um, a list of recommendations presented in priority order, uh, endorsed by the uh, to be endorsed by the IAG at a future date. Uh, this presentation, of course, like the, the the previous fraud presentation, was shared not just with the board but also with the rest of the IAG as well. The one caveat that we would like to just mention is that you know the state of the audit process, the external audit process, is in evolution, like many other things, um, whether it be technology, whether it be AI, uh, we expect that the execution of future audits are likely going to be different. And consequently, the inspection and data transparency regime, regime pardon me, will also need to proactively evolve. So we just keep that in mind, uh, such that there is the proper uh, evolution as we think about these recommendations and as the times change in terms of what is required. Moving on to the first recommendation on slide five. Audit firms, per audit firm provided data and the information gathered as part of the inspections currently made public should be available to investors and the public in a searchable database. Facilitating easier access, in turn analysis. A searchable database would go a significant difference a significant way, pardon me, in helping to enable that. And of course, easier access and more importantly, analysis would allow investors and the public to draw a much more meaningful and holistic set of conclusions about the trends and issues, including on things like audit quality, auditor independence, and of course, financial reporting quality, all important components of protecting investors and the public. Building on that, recommendation two on slide six, we recommend that the board review and revise its bylaws and rules such as EC9 specifically to allow disclosure in its financial, final inspection report to include the name of the public company, i.e. the issuer, who's audited and inspected during the year. First, Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 did not require that such information be withheld from investors and the public. The disclosure of the name of the public company will help investors interpret and co collate a myriad of other information that's already made public by the board and also would allow that to interface with other searchable database, databases that are part and parcel of other regulatory bodies and other entities that share information or provide information regarding that. The ability to be able to cross-reference and integrate much more tightly, not just within the regulatory fabric, but also beyond that would make a significant difference. And the key data point that is not available right now is the, is the issuer. Recommendation three, slide seven, please. Uh, we are recommending that the board consider expanding that searchable database from not just the publicly available information because we understand that the PCAOB has a fair amount of additional information. Uh, just a note here, we had, our subcommittee had previously rec uh, requested a list of um, uh, other information that the PCAOB does collect, but unfortunately we do not have that list. But if we were to make a recommendation, here would be the types of things that we think would be valuable addition to the searchable database of currently, of pu current publicly available information. Um, issuer details, I, go, I understand that they're relatively easy, but it's more for completeness around total assets, total revenue, the date of the last PCAOB inspection. Audit engagement details, uh, things like the firm tenure, the lead engagement partner, the lead partner, the engagement partner, the review partner, oftentimes those are three distinct entities. Uh, the tenure of each of those individuals, the office that the audit is being uh, done, uh, done through, and a series of other information, including the total number of the PCAOB findings, major findings, audit adjustments that were recommended versus made by the PCA, 
recommended by the PCAOB versus made and reflected in the financial statements. On the engagement partner side, independence metrics that has come up in previous uh, uh, conversations, even today, and an important measurement of the partner's role and responsibility and the perception of that partner perhaps across them. Uh, also things like the comp any compensation metrics, uh, restatements, enforcement actions, uh, of course, number of independence and ethics violations as well. The date of completion of the corrective actions. The time period um, can sometimes be short, sometimes be extended. So that would be helpful. Uh, some audit firm details as available uh, to give you, uh, to be able to essentially connect the relevant, the importance of this particular engagement within this particular office across the firm, because that of course has ramifications that could touch on the way in which audits are done at a large office versus a smaller office. It would be informative to be able to make that determination. And of course, if there's any information on audit quality, any information on audit quality indicators as well. Recommendation four, slide eight. The board adhered to a strict timeline in releasing its final inspection reports for each inspected audit. This final inspection report should be available to investors and the public before the date of vote on the ratification of the external auditor. I think we've reached consensus in our previous, in our earlier discussion today regarding the importance of this type of information for investors who are voting on retention versus not of the auditor. It of course helps with not just the, uh, the reappointment stakes, but it also helps the registrant's audit committee provide better oversight on, rec on recommending the auditor reappointment. I know some of the PCAOB standards, at least that I have taken a look through, including guidance that the PCAOB has provided audit committees, which by the way, I found particularly informative uh, in my role as an, both as an audit committee member and as an audit committee chair. While the auditor, the external auditor is required to have specified conversations with the audit committee, understanding and knowing that that has happened and the PCAOB confirming that that has happened is incredibly valuable to investors. Recommendation five, uh, in each final inspection report, the board disclosed the, the key risk criteria used in selecting the audit for inspection. And if the audit was uh, inspection was selected on a random basis, uh, George uh, George Botick, in at least on our panel, was incredibly informative in helping us understand or giving us a perspective on how various issuers and or firms are selected as part of the process. And, and it's a it's a multi layered process, as you would well expect. So sharing that information, disclosing that, it would be helpful. And uh, for those that are selected on a random basis, because we know that some of the issuers that are selected uh, are randomly generated or randomly selected, the inspection report should clearly state so, so that it, it, investors can draw informed conclusions about the inspected audit and the registrant, including its industry, the peer group, et cetera. Recommendation six, the board consider making public the specific actions the inspection team asked of the auditor for each audit that did not comply with the PCAOB standards. Waiting to disclose such information in the final inspection report essentially diminishes its, the value relevant of such information to both investors and the public. There's a balance, we agree, but erring on the side of timeliness in providing information that investors would find valuable, I think would be the preferred skew from our perspective. Recommendation seven, the board benchmark its cycle time. Uh, that is the time from the day the inspection begins to the day the final inspection report is issued to, the, to investors and the public with other federal regulatory agencies 
to, like the FDIC, to implement improvements to its processes to reduce the cycle time to be able to issue the final report in a timely manner. And of course, that connects directly with our recommendation number four. Eight, the board revisit the language surrounding the recently implemented changes to inspection report to its inspection reports, such as information provided to communicate independence violations, et cetera. So for example, disclosures pertaining to the independence violations leaves investors and the public to wonder why the board, when informed of the independence violations, took no action to understand the reasons underlying the non-compliance. And investors are left to wonder whether the inspection team took any steps to independently determine if auditors' objectivity and independence were not indeed impaired. So oh, some more help around the information that, that the inspection reports are sharing. Recommendation nine, should consider revise, the board should consider re revising AS3100, auditor's report on an audit of financial statements to require disclosure of the amount the auditors use to assess whether uncorrected audit adjustments were material at the conclusion of the audit, the basis for making that determination, and a list of the audit adjustments that the auditor proposed that were either material and corrected by management or determined to be immaterial to the consolidated financial statements, but were not corrected. This also connects with our recommendation number three. Our last recommendation is the trust in the PCAOB is based on the agency fulfilling its mission to protect investors and ensure that the audit reports are informative, accurate, and independent. Concern has been expressed from various sources as to whether the board has always met its mandate. As such, regular reviews would help alleviate such concerns. It's common that when federal agencies undertake such reviews, they are made available to the public. Our recommendation is that the PCAOB should undertake a review of its policies, such as EC9, to ensure that they all support the achievement of its mission. These policies, of course, should include the proper guardrails with input from investors and the public to ensure that the board consistently fulfills its mission. Recommendation number 10, we do understand that this recommendation may fall outside the scope and the jurisdiction of the board. Nevertheless, we recommend that the board pursue an initiative aimed at making public the audit work papers after a significant period of time has elapsed. Uh, example, perhaps five or more years. It was uh, interesting to hear this come up in one of our earlier co uh, conversations today. Uh, clearly pre-knowledge that the work papers will be made public in the future will further incentivize audit firms to be more thorough in their, audit, in their audits upfront, encouraging additional discipline and diligence at the time of the audit. We understand that this would not be a simple undertaking, notwithstanding the fact, or not least withstanding the fact that in all of the states, confidentiality around audit working papers would be a significant hurdle. With those 11 recommendations, I would now look to open the floor to some discussion and perhaps some questions. Thank you for your attention. Hal and then Amy. Okay. A, a couple just leveling questions first. How much of the information that was talked about in the 11 recommendations is actually already gathered? And, and George, maybe this is a question for you. As I look through the list and things, I'm assuming you, you're capturing most of this data already? Yes, Hal, no. So just, just, this is more about Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was like, yes, we capture a lot of data, as, as Alicia mentioned. We've talked about that in, in different settings. Through our inspection, we intake a lot, um, as you can imagine. And I think, in my own mind, a lot of this gets to just transparency. 
And there's a lot, lot here in these recommendations, which I think it's fair to say we certainly appreciate the recommendations um, and gives us a lot to think about as we're always trying to not just improve, but also, you know, more, more recently about transparency. And we tried to do that, and I think we've done a lot of that with the new reports that Chair Williams mentioned um, earlier today in her opening remarks, and I think that is a first step as we're thinking about information that we have that will be meaningful to you, investors, certainly other stakeholders, and I just, I'll just i pause with this one. One of the, the challenges beyond, as Alicia mentioned, EC9, other, other confidentiality aspects is from an inspection report perspective is what is meaningful with context, because just putting information out um, is great, but without context around it, that could create other implications to it and how people interpret it, right, wrong, or indifferent. So we've thought a lot about information that we have um, that is meaningful and some of the things we're doing in the report, um, new report format with independence, with, with tenure that will come out in the annual inspected report formats we think are, is good information that we can do in that format without having to have a lot of context around it. But we are, to your question, uh, how on your point, um, continue to think about ways we can make information more transparent through our I, process. I particularly appreciate your context because I'm thinking of my early audit days where on one engagement a million dollars was material and another it was completely immaterial. And, and I think that type of information without context and understanding of a lot more than just the data would be very difficult to be consumed. But before I get there, I want to ask, um, how is the data structured today? Is it is there a taxonomy? Is it is it hard coded? I, I, I'm seeing you gather up all this information, and you've had to work through, I'm sure, several iterations of how the information is gathered, summarized, consistency is challenged, all that. How is that done today? So we, so we um, intake information. Uh, I'll simply put through data requests that come in from the firms. Um, either on an annual basis or for a spe specific inspection. So it's a, it's, a, it's a formalized data process that we then pull in. Um, and you know, again, one can always improve when it comes to data sets and, and, and the, the cleanliness, so to speak, of the data that we go through and the data wrangling to get it. And over time, I think that has been improved and will continue to improve as we think about our internal yeah. systems. Um, but, but fundamentally, we're, we're ingesting it through data requests from the firm. Okay, is there a taxonomy? How's it? If I were to go search that, because I'm asking, if we were to push all this data out, there'd have to be some search mechanism. Correct. Would it be through a taxonomy similar to XBRL, or is this a free-form type of database? I, I, Th there is a understand. data. There is a data library. Okay. I mean, I just okay. I'd want to know a lot more before we pushed out because I think there were a lot of mistakes made with the XBRL, XBRL rollout of tagging all the data in the 10 Qs and Ks, but, so I'd have a lot of questions. But a bigger question, and Jack and I were talking about this very briefly, what type of investor would most likely benefit from this? One of the issues that we've dealt with in the past is we, we provide all this great data, but it's really for an incredibly narrow set of investors. And I'm gonna put aside for a moment users. I can imagine the academics would love this. Um, and lots of academic papers would be written on it, and I think we'd get some valuable insights. But if this is initially and primarily for investors, I'm just really curious as to we could do a lot of work and find very few investors really use the information. So I'm curious as to who we actually see. It's not the, you know, the uh, indexers that Sandy was talking about earlier today, and you start narrowing down the universe of, fundamental investors who could possibly use this and then would have the ability to use the information, you get to a really small subset. Hell, sorry to interrupt, but I think yeah. Amy, I would like to give her an opportunity to ask her question and then Gina. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Saba. Um, thanks, Hal, for that. I guess I just, before I ask my question, I want to just maybe comment on something you just said. You know, given that a lot of this data is currently unavailable, it's, I would say, virtually impossible to know what the uptake would be on who would use it, how many people would use it. Um, and I would say that it would likely evolve over years, just like the financial statements have. As people have gotten better at analyzing, have used technology, they've been able to use more and more of that data to potentially produce better outcomes. 
I don't know that I agree with all these recommendations or not, but I think it would be difficult to extrapolate an outcome if we don't already have, the data is not available. Investors don't even know that it's being collected. Um, so I think that's a hard conclusion to come to without the release of the data, but just put it out there. Um, Alicia, I know that I participated in many, if not all, of the calls of the subcommittee, but I do have a question on recommendation two, and, and it's not meant to be provocative, so hopefully it's not taken as such, but this is the one related to releasing the name of the company um, who was audited and inspected during the year. I can see significant pros and cons with this one, um, and I have concerns surrounding, you know, potentially negative findings and the impact on a publicly traded company and their stock and potential overreaction, et cetera, things that we've seen in the marketplace, unfortunately, in recent times. Um, did the subcommittee, I can't remember, did, did you all talk about those implications? Um, can you just share some of the things that you may have spoken about? Sure. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, there was vigorous debate on every single one of these recommendations. Uh, I do not want to underestimate that sentence in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there are, as you've pointed out, Amy, pros and cons to identifying the issuer. Uh, clearly, some of the pros are that you can now connect this information with a variety of other information that is available. In addition to that, speaking as both an investor as well as a auditor in my private in my previous life a external auditor in my previous life the fact that the audit was determined to have issues does question the quality of the financial statements so while in one sense and speaking only for myself i do agree with what you're saying i'm not so sure that the issuer is necessarily scot-free in, in, in all of this. There's, there are nuances to, to all of this. And I think ultimately determining what the greater outcome and impact is from an investor and public perspective would be the way in which to assess this as opposed to just from the issuer's perspective or just from the external audit firm's perspective. Does that answer the question, Amy? Yeah, I think so. I think that we we should, you know, continue to talk about that. I think there are some far-reaching implications there, but I don't disagree with your conclusion either. It's just it's sticky wicket. That's my technical term for the it day. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. So Gina and then Jen. Jen. Um, so I guess first I'm going to make a quick brief comment on Hal's question about data and who would use it. I think the, the, the big uptake initially would actually be by um, the those who score governance um, scores, ISS, Glass-Lewis, and those. And by virtue of them, you would actually hit a very broad group of, of investors who would utilize that information almost immediately. And so I think that, that getting it into the right hands um, actually promulgates the knowledge that the data even exists quite can can do that quite quickly today we are in a very data hungry environment as more and more data analysis tools become more and more available so i think that, that, that there's something to be said for that um we will Gina, obviously make yes before you continue may i just add that i completely agree with what you said and another angle here and it, it's aligned perfectly with what the pcaob at least as i understand is seeking to do in terms of um, uh, audit committees and in further engagement with them that would also be a connection here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and we will have more on that as well when we do give our findings um, from the data and technology and innovation subcommittee. Um, but the comment that I had actually was with regard to the most controversial one, which was item number 11, um, that would um, kind of create the, the threat of transparency <laughs> of the work papers. Um, and I don't know to what degree um, that is necessarily in or out of scope here. Um, but I thought it was an interesting, um, uh, an interesting recommendation, which is that if the work papers are made are, are are intended to make public to be made public later at some point, that it would create the urgency to have them be complete and as well done as possible. Was that the idea? 
Yes, because some of the findings uh, that the PCOB has noted in the past is around perhaps not ideal work papers, work practices around working papers. Mm -hmm. And that is problematic to say the least. Mm -hmm. So clearly something that could assist in that fashion. Mm -hmm. But let me just be very explicit on this. Part of the reason why this is recommendation number 11 is that this is definitely not a near term achievable recommendation. It is much more likely to be a medium term and it would require a significant initiative on the part of the PCAOB. I believe every state has a confidentiality of audit work papers mm. in on the statute. Mm. Okay, it's just curious. Thank you, Gina. Jack? Question for George. Uh, we were talking about uptake of <clears throat> what the, well, of the prospective things that you have, that if they were released, what might be the uptake? I'm just curious, on auditor search, that's like the best thing you've got, done so far. And a good example to learn from. I was wondering if you had any idea what the uptake is like on that, if, if there's any way to tell, maybe from email addresses of people that downloaded or requests or anything. Who's using it? Has the, has the uptake increased over the last five years? Uh, just any kind of thing that you can share about auditor search and the, uh, the hunger for that kind of data that you've made transparent. Yeah, we do track, we do track obviously use of our website. I don't have the statistics yeah. in here, but how, who's using or how much, how often, but it is tracked and we do know uh -huh. that certainly um, that is useful. We've heard it, not just tracking it, but just your comments that, that things we've all heard from various sources that is very useful to do a search on you know, it, it could be improved, data. but the CSB files. Yeah. Okay. Also, if I could just. Jeff? Oh. Sorry. That's all right. No, no, go ahead, Jeff. I'm done. Th thanks, Ella. Uh, since Jack asked George a question, I, I then have to ask you a question, George. It's just the way it works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike. My question, George, is I'm, I'm aware of some recent interviews of former um, inspectors of the PCOB where they're asked a number of questions, and, and one of the responses that they provided uh, was with respect uh, to the inspection reports, and they said something along the lines of that the creation of the final inspection report is a complex and lengthy process of review, editing, and approval by nearly every level of the PCOB. Um, so as, as you know, uh, ever since PCOB was formed, there's often been comments about how long it takes to get the report out. And obviously, there, there's some value to get information out earlier than later, no matter what the information is. Um, so my question is, have you looked I mean, when's the last time you looked at the process and figured out, you know, what aspect of that process is creating the most time? Uh, so when's the last time you've done that? And um, um, is that an area that you spent some time on just trying to figure out where in this process we might be able to cut a little time so that we can respond to this long-standing concern of investors and others that these reports come out too lately. Too late. Sorry. Yeah, no, Jeff. No, I appreciate that comment. I know that comes up all the time, and it's 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 you know you look at the numbers historically. That has been a very fair comment. And let me just take some of your your points in order in terms of the analysis. Um, this may this may come out a bit flip, and I don't mean it to be. We look at it all the time because it is a topic that um, not just myself, but a number of uh, program leaders across the division, a number of other associate directors are looking at kind of step by step, how can we improve that process? How can we reduce that cycle time from the team leaving the field, comment forms being issued, to getting a draft report out? Yes, there is, a, it is a fair statement, there is a, a review process um, that we go through that is hierarchical, if you will, um, particularly for the, the, the larger firms and the alien inspected firms. That we have, there's a very, very thorough 
process we go through. Um, starts with a comment form being issued just very quickly. That fir the firm responds to it typically to the, the, to the, the comment form. We go, we, you know, rebuttal process, they disagree. So it's very methodical. We go through, we're trying to make sure nothing um, um, is, is left in terms of are we, are we right, if you will. And that goes through reviewing with Barb's team, with our general counsel's office. I mean, ultimately going to the board certainly for for, for approve, review and approval. Um, we continue to look at it. Yes, there are areas where we're where we're shaving things off. Um, now, the, the challenge becomes when you shave things off. Does that at the end of the day does that have a meaningful difference shortening that cycle? So we're even thinking more broadly. How can we we shorten it more dramatically? And that's something as we look forward. Um, as, as Chair Williams said this morning, we're we're, we're a lot of reports were issued last year, the highest, I think, in board uh, history. Um, and, we, and you look at where we stand today, we're better than we were a year ago. We did have a backlog build up. This isn't to make excuse, but when we changed the format three or four years ago, things stopped for a while, and it's taken us a while to get caught up. Now we're, we're caught up, essentially, um, and we're looking to reduce that going forward. So it is a high commitment, not just by the staff, I think it's fair to say, of the board of the PCOE as well, to reduce that cycle time. That, that's great. I appreciate the response. And just a quick follow-up. So of the many parts of the process, which part have you identified that sucks up the most time, and is there still potential for room there to reduce the time for that part of the process? I think the, the, the fundamental point is the issuance of the comment forms. And if, if that and there's, there's a plethora of reasons why that might take longer. The easy will be we have a consultation. We have, a, we have someone, if we're not sure, we go through a formal consultation process. Those are, those are somewhat outliers, but that can, that can elongate that process. But, but also, you know, just as we talk with the firms, is, is workload of our staff and making sure backlog doesn't build up because once someone gets behind, um, no fault of their own, it's then, then they're always trying to catch up. So we, we're looking and we, we track very closely the, the, the time frame to issue comment forms. And if we can get that, within our parameters, then that makes everything else, generally speaking, move much quicker. Um, there are, when you look at this very broadly, I'll just say this quickly, um, when you look at the workflow across the firms, um, you know, we receive certain work at different times throughout the year based on their cycles. So that doesn't elongate our process, but what it looks like when a report comes out, if, if information comes later in the year, that just kind of makes it longer to get it out in the following year. So there's a, there's a number of things we're looking at, currently looking at, um, to try to think differently. I call it a moonshot, if you will, to try to pull this forward so it is much more timely than, than it's been in the past. Thank you. I'm glad it took a couple of minutes to get back to me because I, I wanted to think more and more about Gina's comment about governance. And I appreciate the the, the um, observation on her part. It scares me to no end, because what would end up happening is you'd put a tremendous amount of power in the hands of a few people. And I could, George used the term context. I think I could really twist these numbers in anything in this data set to come out with any answer that I wanted. And I think that the, the risk of misuse of this data is far greater than any benefit. I question whether or not investors would actually benefit from this to start with. If so, it's a relatively small population, but the risk of misuse of this data to me is far greater. And I'd want the board and the staff to think really long and hard about the unintended consequences. And I'll just use recommendation 11 as an example of that. Um, the, with five years of hindsight, I could take the words that are used and written in any set of work papers and come to any conclusion that I want to come to. And that just illustrates the broader issue. So I think that the board needs to really think very closely about, let's just lock it up or leave it at unintended consequences. And, I, and I'm a, personally a huge believer in big data and analysis. This is not the place to, to do it. I'm sorry. I would offer a contrasting, oh. I would offer a contrasting view, perhaps. Uh, when I think about that in the context of financial statements being presented to the market, I think multiple 
eyes looking at the same set of financial statements can reach very different conclusions. And that is ultimately what makes the market. So the availability of data and having more eyes looking at it generally, I, I think, is a, is, a, is a positive outcome, not a negative outcome. I, I appreciate that comment, and, and I think that's a really good thing to consider. The more people looking at it, does that have a cleansing process? But, and I have not looked at work papers in a really long time, and I'm not sad about that in any way. Um, <laughs> but unless the writing has improved dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years, I would be fearful of anything I wrote five years from now would be taken out of context. And I thought I was a halfway decent writer and really thought about what was put in work papers and how it was phrased and everything. What I saw actually scared me even then. It would scare me even more five years later. So I, I, again, I think a lot more thought would have to go into any of these recommendations. That's kind of what I wanted to mention. Um, to that point, it, it's a really valuable one. The subcommittee that has been working on this, and Alicia's the sole representation, representative of, um, unfortunately, today, um, but has done a fantastic job in relaying the opinions and the process that they went through to derive these recommendations. I think the next aspect of the governance uh, would, not that we have a formal governance manual, so to speak, but we do have, um, you know, a charter. And I think what would need to happen is the IAG as a whole would need to continue to talk about these recommendations, flush them out additionally, and ultimately vote on, in some fashion or another, what we want to put forward to the board so that they, if we can't come to a consensus perspective, at least we all have our views out there in the public forum so that they can consider all of them. And um, uh, so that's kind of, I think, the next step. So I, I just don't want you to feel like you won't be heard, because we, we Oh, I have no concerns. Okay. I, I will make sure I speak loudly enough. <laughs> if I could just uh, <clears throat> tack on a little bit to what Hal was saying. I don't, some of these, I th like you said, we have to talk about all of them and consider them. Some of them are more palatable than others. But on the work paper, when you know, I think about what Sandy said about the indexers. I don't think they want to go back and look at five years ago work papers if they're indexing. And I think about the active investors. And typically, in, from what I've seen in buy-side shops, typical analyst has 25 or 30 companies to follow, and they're not even reading 10Ks and 10Qs now. It's as I can't remember who said it, but you know they're looking at pieces of financial statements, the ones that have, the pieces that are appealing to them on Bloomberg or CalcBench or FactSet, um, and they're hard pressed to go back and read the 10Ks or the Qs. They're not going to want to go back and look at work papers from five years ago. I don't find this to be practically useful for active investors. It, it and oh, if oh, and another Sorry. step, I mean. A lot of the recommendations that we come up with, I, you know, I think they're designed to turn up the heat on auditors, which is not a bad thing, but then you got to remember, it's still got to be a, an attractive profession for people to go into. And if we keep on turning up the heat and boiling the frogs, we're going to have <laughs> dead frogs for auditors. You know, we, we, we can't you know, throw the baby out with the bash. Well, I, I'm just coming up with worse and worse analogies, but <laughs> but you've got the idea. You know, we we have to bring it. We have to bring it home. Oh, yeah, analogies, metaphors, like that. Okay, I'm done. It, just one quick to quantify that. We, we this topic was at lunch today, and I said I estimated for the 50 companies that each of my analysts followed, they had to cover about uh, 2,000 pages of information per year when you add up all the Qs and the Ks and the analyst reports and the earnings releases and the supplemental data packages and all this is about 2,000 pages. And, and I know for a fact I was not reading all 2,000 pages times three for 150 companies, 300,000 pages. I just wasn't doing that. Um, so we have to really think about the volume of information. And if we were going down a path like this, you really are just you're picking winners and losers, and what you're doing is you're saying the quants are the winners in this, and the fundamental analysts who stop and think about the companies and meet with the, the management, they're the, they'll end up being the losers in this process. 
Yeah. I think, Hal, that, that with artificial intelligence, that you're just going to have the machines read them and summarize things for you. And so you, you can do that process more quickly. I mean, one of the things that I've worried about in this conversation about artificial intelligence is that it's actually going to create that board you talk about in Norwalk to disclose less information because companies are going to want to try and keep things more private. But I also think that um, the ability to consume all of that information is something that can assist analysts in doing the work that needs to be done and the fewer number of cell side analysts I, actually yeah. are. I, I, I appreciate the artificial intelligence you know, point of view. It, it, I have great concern about that from an investment perspective. Um, it's not to say that the you know, analysts get it all right, but I think artificial intelligence could really just run us off the rails even quicker than we run off the rails. I, I, I'm not saying it's unguided, so. right? I, I still haven't figured out how it to destroying the world happens based on all these people saying Well, it, what right? was the, the, the one artificial intelligence system that ends up killing the controller? Hell. You know. Hell. 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 Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that intended? I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> so Sandy, and then I see David's hand up. Yeah, I would just add to Jack's comment that a lot of this intel gets old after three months. I mean, that's a practical reality of it. And uh, I, I just raised the question of if this data actually starts being presented in the public, this must have some... What's the SEC going to say about it? What's... <laughs> this is... Uh, it raised questions of adequate disclosure potentially five years after the fact. Maybe that's actually maybe kind of irrelevant, so the SEC wouldn't care, but except it just... The, except for litigation. Exactly. And I'm not, not even certain there. Statute of Reg FD, there's going to be more information in that work paper than they, the company's ever shared. So it's, it makes an interesting problem across the matrix of influencers in this space. There's a lot of influencers. David, you're next. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, thanks, Saba. I mean, in, in general, I'd be very much in favor of transparency, but I think it's always worth thinking about what's the end goal of all of this, which is to encourage better audits. And I think sometimes when we talk about this, we we see the data as being linear, that the data is produced, there's an investor out there who looks at it, and they change the way that they're going to buy or sell or vote or anything like that. It's also worth, though, thinking about the endogenous nature of uh, data. You know, the reason we have streetlights isn't just that the police can arrest the criminals, it's that we don't have the criminals in the first place. And so by making stuff public, you change the way that people will behave. And I wonder whether that's an important part of thinking about this as well. Also, of course, by making things public, you will change the nature of the data that people will record. Um, a, and that can have negative and positive consequences as well. So I, 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 I guess I'm agreeing with everybody around the table, um, both in terms of transparency, a good thing, but be careful what it is that you're wishing for here and think about what all the consequences are as you go forward with this the endogeneity and the exogeneity of the data. So is this someone outside that is uh, changing or is it the person that's being reported on that's changing? And if you are going to make all of this data public, do you change the nature of the data by doing that? And is that a positive thing to do? Thank you, David. Sandy Peters? But I guess, you know, as I'm thinking about um, this this recommendation is, we've got from this morning's conversation of we don't have anything but CAMs and how good are they to releasing all the work papers, right? <laughs> and, 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 um, but later. an inconsistency here? No, what I'm saying is, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is there's a middle ground, right? And we need to maybe go through the particular items and decide what is most useful, what is most relevant, what produces good behavior, right? what produces good outcomes, what facilitates the conversation 
um, for investors. Yeah. I mean, I look at some of the, you know, release all the work papers. I'm not sure I'm a fan of that, but, you know, during the financial crisis, there were a lot. I was the audit partner on Fidget, and it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and I was completely confident that my work papers were going to be great, right? <laughs> And I, I mean, I remember showing it to my husband and saying, see, remember how I used to complain about working on these work papers? I'm sleeping well tonight, right? Um, but I'm not saying that is, I'm not saying that's the right answer, but I do think that there is, it it's, gets back to the credence good concept, right? You've got to give something to allow people to evaluate, uh, investors to evaluate whether this good, this car, that they can give it a test drive, if you will, right? And what does that, where's the middle ground there? I like the way you phrase that, the middle ground. If I had my choice, if I were still an investor, what I'd want within six months or a year after the audit is out, I'd want that summary review memorandum, the post or the end of the audit, pull that, together you know, all the issues in 10 pages or 20, whatever it is for that size engagement. If you just gave me that, I'd say, huh, they gave me the cams I really needed when I needed them, and now here are the other things that didn't quite make it but were close. I don't need the rest of those work papers. You know, that's funny that you say that because w when I came to CFA and I was ex trying to explain to my boss who was on the SAG, who was a lawyer, about what he really wanted, I was like, you don't really want auditor rotation because it takes a long time to learn about these companies, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I've been one, mm -hmm. you think three years, that's just when you're figuring out what's going on, right? And the human behavior. Yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly. What you want is the completion memo, which is exactly what you're saying. And that's what we hope that the CAMS and that going back to the original conversation this morning, was intended to give us a little bit of insight into. And the discussion of, of um, what was the, Glencore, is more in line with that, exactly. related to contemporary issues and current risks, and to the point at the very beginning, how can these not change over time, right? Is any CAM gonna be on commercial real estate this year, right? You'd think, right? <laughs> Just a little bit, right? I, I, I'm guessing it's, you're not gonna see one, right? It might be in Cecil, some of it, maybe. <laughs> but I, I think that's what we're trying to um, get at, right? And back to our recommendation related to that, I think you know, we have a responsibility to say, these are the issues that the world is talking about related to this company. Where are they, right? I mean, as active investors, we need to say, where are they? Okay, so we've solved the problem. Yep. Let's release that in the audit memo. Okay. George, on that. This, <laughs> this is a great discussion. Let's, we have two questions, one for, from Jeff and another from Amy. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this during the break, but as Sandy said, that was a big part of the discussion throughout the development of CAMS. That memo is very important. Are there pieces of that memo we can get in a CAM that would be useful to investors. And, and that was a major goal, not the only goal, but a major goal of the CAM project. Thank you. Mike, this is a question that's unrelated to this presentation in particular, but dovetails on what um, Sandy Peters was just saying with regard to more dynamic CAMs, I guess. I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of my sense of it, is less boilerplate, less obvious CAMs, but something more relevant to today's marketplace. And I'm just curious, because I'm not an auditor and I don't speak auditor, um, but I just like, what I'm wondering is, is are there firm-wide procedures that would have to be designed for these types of dynamic disclosures that may not be timely enough to allow for the development of those procedures in order to release a, or to put a can <coughs> into a financial report? I, I don't, I just don't know the answer. You would think that, you would think that if there is an emerging issue, generally the firms have guidance, I mean, back in the day, um, that have guidance that says, this is an emerging issue, these are the things you need to look out for. I don't know what that looks like today. I've been a long time, but yeah, I mean, I think in the banking issue that's come up, the real question is, if you are an auditor of a lot of these institutions, why don't you have some standard? Why? What's the firm-wide policy on not just intent to hold the maturity, but ability, right? So there should be, yes, there should be, but whether that's happening and whether it's happening fast enough, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know anymore. 
I just wonder how realistic that expectation is. I mean, I think investors in general didn't recognize the magnitude and speed with which interest rates were going up. So to expect a large auditing firm to develop firm-wide procedures for that, I, I just don't know if that's realistic, but I just don't know. I, 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 think, it, I think it is. I mean, okay. there, there was... There was discussion externally amongst investors about interest rates and articles in the Wall Street Journal about it, right? You And SBB was mentioned in November as one example, right? So there was stuff out there. And it was in the press every day, right? So, uh, you know, those are emerging market risks that need, you know, you as an audit partner have to look at as you go through and say, how am I addressing this risk and what, where does it show up, right? Like commercial real estate is an example too, right? But it's just how, how fast, how good the firm is at doing that, how the particular yeah. industry is. Just leaders. on that one issue, if you go back to the third quarter, like 2021. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, if you go back to the third quarter of, I think, 2022, Two. Two, yeah. I mean, you could already start to see the, oh, 2021, actually. Uh, you could actually start to see some of the 2021? impact. 2021, really? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I thought it was two. Yeah. No. Third, fourth quarter of 2021, you can start to actually see it in the numbers for a number, for, for all the banks, but in particular some. Yeah. But the Fed didn't even get it, right? I got to call the other guys and say, hey, look, see what's going on over there. I would suggest as someone who's covered the financial sector as an investor for a number of years, too many that I want to recall and the crises that I've had to navigate, the compression, right, the specifics of the, the, the compression on the interest rate spread sometimes masked the issue. And speaking from an audit perspective, I always bear in mind that that incremental disclosure and the impact on going concern, i.e. precipitating what may have been continuing to be a going concern to no longer being a going concern is an important distinction, to, is an important point to also be thinking about. And I wonder, um, it's been a long time since I've been an external auditor, but I wonder how much the partners are thinking about that as in, is this going to precipitate? So, Again, you know, a series of a series of issues to be to be thinking about. Nothing is black and white here, in my opinion. Are there any other questions for Alicia or George or anybody else? No, Alicia, thank you for that. That was a really robust discussion. Um, before I turn it over to Saba to close, I just want to say thanks to everybody here. I just had a great day and a lot of great discussion. I think there's going to be a lot of nice takeaways and definitely learnings from today. So thanks for everybody for your opinions and thoughts. Saba? Thank you, Amy. And I just wanted would like to echo Amy. Thank you to everyone for joining us in this room as well as virtually. Uh, we significantly appreciate your contributions to today's discussion. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the fall IAG meeting. Thank you. And for those of you who are traveling back to your destinations, safe travels, the meetings is it adjourned?